We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we thank him upon all conditions, we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us, Amen. My beloved brothers and sisters, this is going to be a very serious speech. And this is going to be something I'd like you to listen to very carefully. You and I know that Muslims follow the Quran because it is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I know that it is something we don't doubt. Not at all. There's no doubt in the Quran. And you and I know that just following the Quran alone, we can look at it from two different angles. One is a group of people who truly follow the Quran, that Quran will automatically lead them to what else they have to do. Did you hear what I said? If you truly follow the Quran, the Quran will tell you things. The Quran will explain to you what needs to be done. And then you will, as a result, follow what the Quran asks you to follow. If a man says, I follow the Quran, do you pray? No, I don't pray. But it's a verse in the Quran. No, I just follow the Quran. I don't pray. It doesn't make sense. If someone says, I follow the Quran, but I don't give zakah, or charity. But the Quran says give charity. You say, no, I don't mind that. I just follow the Quran. So your interpretation of following the Quran is just a recital. You hear it, it's a melody to your ears. That's it, melody. It's now become such that you don't mind about the contents of the book. But what you are bothered about is just what it sounds like, the melody. And you will say, MashaAllah, Sheikh Mahir al Mu'ayqili, beautiful recital. MashaAllah, Sheikh Sudais, beautiful recital. Sheikh Abdul Basit, Abdul Samad, beautiful recital. And it stops there. It stops exactly there. Why? Because the instruction of the Quran becomes irrelevant. This is a mistake that a lot of people are making. Some knowingly. If it is knowingly, some of the scholars say it can remove you from the fold of Islam because what's the point of calling yourself a Muslim when Islam actually means to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submit. There's no submission. You haven't even submitted to the law of Allah. When Allah says dress in a specific way, you didn't do that. When he says pray, you didn't pray. When he says give zakah, you didn't give zakah. When he says abstain from alcohol and intoxicants, you didn't and so on. And then you want to call yourself a Muslim. So if a person intentionally does that knowingly and really thinks that there's nothing more to the Quran than just a recitation, the scholars say that person cannot call himself a true Muslim. It's a fact. But there are others who simply don't know the meaning because they are lazy. From among those who don't know the meaning because they are lazy and they didn't do enough to understand the Quran, there are two categories of people. Who are these two? One, those who still follow what the Quran says because they learnt it from other sources. I think a lot of us would fall into that category where we don't know the meaning because we are lazy. Remember, if you don't know the meaning of the Quran, there's no other reason besides laziness. That's why I'm just going to say that. There's no other reason. Don't give me excuses. I'm sorry. I won't accept them. You can try and convince yourself it's only laziness. If you wanted to do anything, you would. Trust me. This you did not. That's what I'm saying. And I'm wording it this way because I want it to be the strongest encouragement to you to say, go back and do something. That's all. I don't mean to insult you, but I mean to say you don't know the meaning of the Quran because you are lazy. If, you, if it was anything that was relevant to you today, tomorrow, you would have done it. If someone told me, or you, that you know you will die in three days unless you go and read this big book and you follow what it says regarding your diet, that book will be read and understood tonight and by tonight the diet will commence. 
Why? I don't want to die. Well, Allah says if you don't want to die, a different type of a death, and that's a spiritual death, whereby you lose your entire akhirah, then you have to read this book and you have to follow it. So anyway, let's go back to what I was saying. We fall into the category of, a lot of us fall into the category of, we don't understand the Quran, but we follow its rulings because we learned it, alhamdulillah, from other sources. That's good enough for now. It's good enough for now. But don't get too comfortable here. Why? It's not the aim. It's only like when you don't have water, you're allowed to do tayammum. Do you understand? When you don't have water, you're allowed to do, you have to do tayammum. Tayammum is to apply some dust in a specific way to cleanse yourself. It doesn't mean that now you must carry bags of sand on your, on your back and you must walk with it everywhere. No, that's foolish because you know this is only by the way since I don't have water, I'm going to be doing this. And you know what? As soon as I get the water, I'm going to make sure that I wash myself, right? The same applies, you don't understand the Quran, mashallah, you learned the rules and regulations and you learned it from a source, sometimes the madrasa. When we were kids, we went to the madrasa. The scholar taught us, or the scholars taught us, the teachers taught us sometimes how to recite the Quran. I'm talking of recitation without understanding, okay? They taught it to us. They taught us the do's and don'ts. They told us how to dress. They taught us how to read salah and so on. MashaAllah, it's good. But that still is a bag of sand. I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's still a bag of sand. It was good, it worked. It's not like it's not working. And it will carry on. You want to build yourself? Build yourself further. There is a way of doing it. So basically, the second group of people, those who do not know the meaning of the Quran and they couldn't be bothered. They don't know its rules and regulations either. And we are not from among those. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our progeny and our offspring and may Allah make us from those who really feel guilty when we listen to the Quran and we don't know what is being said. I pause for a moment because everyone has different questions in their mind regarding what I just said. What did I say? May Allah make us feel guilty when we listen to the Quran and don't understand it. Amen. Why do I say this? My brothers and sisters, you will agree with me that when we listen to a beautiful recital, it affects the heart even if you don't understand it. It's the power of the Quran. You get a full reward even if you don't understand the Quran to try and read it and even to listen to it. It's great. I'm not saying no. But I'm saying imagine how powerful the impact will be when you understand it. Imagine the impact. So, an Najashi started crying and weeping and he accepted Islam. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu cried and he accepted Islam. So many people, one, two, three, or four verses, their lives were moved with us. Oh, we've heard the melody over and over again. Our life is actually going backwards sometimes. It hasn't moved. It hasn't progressed. Why? Because we don't know what's being said. It has a spiritual impact. Even the plants are impacted by the recitation of the Quran. Even the non-Muslims are impacted by a beautiful, correct recitation of the Quran because it's the word of Allah you cannot deny it but we as Muslimin need to do more to learn this beautiful Quran then going back to what I started with when the Quran instructs us to do something we have to follow we have to follow or if we are weak listen carefully and we haven't followed at least in our heart we should know this is what I should be following and inshallah one day I will get there soon. So uh, the duty is you have to follow. But if you are weak and for some reason you haven't, I'm not justifying anything here. I'm speaking about reality. If you haven't done it as the way you are supposed to do it, I'm sure all of us seated here, we feel in our hearts, I'd like to do it the right way. Inshallah, may Allah make me strong. May Allah make us all strong. I mean. So, in the Quran, Allah says, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَاكُمْ عَنُّ فَأَنْتَهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ That which the messenger has given you, take it. Consider it instruction. 
If it's a prohibition, consider it prohibition. That which the messenger has instructed, take it. That which he has prohibited, consider it prohibited. And fear Allah. Doesn't that show you that the statements and utterances of the Prophet ﷺ are absolutely important? Doesn't it show you that Allah is instructing you in the Quran to follow the messenger? And yet there are people sitting back relaxing and saying, I follow the Quran. That's it. As for the hadith, I'm not interested. As for the life of the messenger, I'm not interested. As for the instructions of the messenger, may peace be upon him, I don't want. Why? Because I just follow the Quran. The Quran, there's no doubt. As for the words of the messenger, there's doubting. Well, who brought the Quran? That's the question. Who brought it? Imagine the man who gave you the message. You're not believing his, the rest of his words and you're believing some of his words. Well, if he was a liar, the Quran would not be valid anyway because it came from him. Ultimately, the connection, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but through him, am I not right? He's the one who brought it to us. So if you don't want to accept what he says, why did you accept the Quran? It's foolish. How can I say this Quran is revelation? Because why? Because Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it's revelation. As for his own words, I don't believe them. <laughs> Come on. Where's the logic gone? Where's the brains? And guess what? Hadith of Al Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu and Al Miqdam ibn Ma'di Karib. There are several ahadith, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Sunan Abi Dawood, where the Prophet wasallam has predicted that there will come a time when people will sit back and relax. A man sitting on his recliner, the word used in the Arabic language is al-Arika, is like a reclining chair. يَقُولُ هَذَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ He will be saying, this is the book of Allah. What is in it, I will consider correct. But, Anything besides it, I don't want. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ala wa inni Qur'ana wa mithlahu ma'ahu. Behold, I have been given the Qur'an and something similar to it with it, which is the Sunnah. Which means the explanations of the Qur'an will be primarily found in the Sunnah. When a messenger of a king comes to you with, an, with a message, and he says, the king has given you a message. And you say, what is the message? So he recites it to you. And he says, the king has said that you need to get up at five o'clock in the morning. And you need to do this and you need to do that. Then you ask them, well, how should I do it? He will explain it to you. But the explanation may not be the words of the king in a specific level. But it will be the explanation, the source of which was definitely the king. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا يُوحَىٰ He does not utter from his desires, al-hawa, that which is you know, from his own whims and fancies, but everything he says is inspired, revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything he uttered is sacred, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you cannot discount what the messenger has said. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ It is not for a believing male or female. It is not for a believing male or female. So if you're not a believer, it's, it's one of those things. But someone who claims to believe, it is not for a believing male or female that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger, peace be upon him, have decided something that they feel they have an option in that regard. So Allah didn't say it's not for a believer that when Allah decides something, then, but he says when Allah decides something or his messenger has made a ruling, 
has decided something, has instructed something, has said something that they feel that they have a choice in that regard. If they feel they have a choice, they cannot call themselves true believers because this verse says it's not for a believer to feel that he or she has a choice. Then Allah says, whoever transgresses against Allah, goes against the instruction of Allah and goes against the instruction of the messenger, they have indeed gone astray. They have gone astray in a manifest, clear, open way. That's clear instruction. And the reason I say this, Wallahi, the number of people on the globe at the moment who are saying, I accept the Quran. As for the hadith, no, we discounted. There's too much dispute in the hadith. So we discounted. You know, there's weak hadith, there's fabricated hadith, there's correct hadith. So to come out of that whole thing, we'd rather just leave it. Well, I say, on the globe, there is stolen money, there is money that is usurped, there is money that is really, you know, that which is not clean, there is money that is laundered perhaps, there is all sorts of dirty money and there is legitimate money. So if that is your idea, quit all money. Whenever you see money, say, I'm not touching it. Why? Because some of it is dirty on, in the world. Will you say that? You won't. Sometimes, even if it's not legitimate, you will sit and think to yourself, how can I legitimize this money? Right? When you tell people the riba is haram, for example, they will come to you and say, but you know, but, but, the word but already means, hang on, it's hard, right? Or, there's something I want you to talk about. Listen, the ruling is the ruling. You need to know that. If you're doing something wrong, there are two types of people. Listen carefully, I'm just diverting in order to say something important. If you are doing something sinful, considering it sinful, you are a Muslim who is sinful. If you are doing something sinful, believing it is not sinful, you may not be a Muslim anymore. Remember this. There's a difference. Did you hear what I said? A person eating interest or drinking alcohol or committing adultery and they believe that drinking alcohol is wrong, committing adultery is wrong, eating interest is wrong. They are Muslims who are sinful. But if a person is drinking alcohol, committing adultery and eating interest and justifying it and saying, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with this. They have gone directly against the verses of the Quran. So what happens? The scholars say that the chances are this person cannot call themselves Muslim. I'm wording it very carefully because I don't want to say hard words. But it's hard. So there are more and more people saying the Prophet وسلم, his life and all that is not important it was not important what's important is the Quran so you need to know the responses in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's verses of the Quran which they are accepting they are saying that look this is the Quran okay we're taking it all right let's only use the Quran to show you that you have to adopt the Sunnah point number one Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu It's a surah known as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, oh you who believe, follow Allah and follow the messenger. Why? It was enough for him to say follow Allah. That was enough. But Allah knows there will come people who are going to say we don't want to follow the messenger, we'll only follow Allah. So Allah says, follow Allah and follow the messenger. And don't negate or nullify your deeds. What is meant by nullification of deeds? You know, a person does deeds. If those deeds don't meet the basic requirements, they are not considered deeds. Here we are talking of acts of worship. When I want to worship Allah, how do I worship Allah? It's a good question, right? Allah alone decides how He wants to be worshipped. When you walk into, for example, the palace of the king and you need to greet him, the people will explain to you how exactly you need to greet. You don't just walk in and say, yo guy, what's up man? That's a king for example. You walk into a president's place. You don't just greet him with a high five, you know. There is a way of greeting him. Who will decide it? The protocol, right? You walk in a certain way, you go in a certain way, you, they will explain to you. When you break it, what will happen? They may penalize you or they may kick you out of that, of that palace. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to know that He sent messengers. Their primary aim was to instruct us, number one, who is Allah? Number two, 
How is he to be worshipped? That's primary. There are many other things that came that come later, halal and haram and whatnot, but we're talking here of acts of worship. One of the duties of the messengers is to explain to you how Allah wants to be worshipped. So if you take the messenger out of the equation, you won't know how to worship Allah. Allah says in the Quran, What does that mean? A lot of you would know the first part of it. Establish your prayer. How? The Quran doesn't say how. So then Allah says, give your zakah. How? How much? What percentage? What am I supposed to give zakah on? The Quran doesn't explain it. So then Allah says, Ati'ur Rasulam. And follow the messenger. So by following the messenger, many things will happen and you will have an explanation as to how to fulfill your salah and how to give your zakah. And then Allah ends the verse by saying, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that you can achieve mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you don't follow the messenger, you won't achieve mercy. Secondly, if you don't follow the messenger, you won't know how to read Quran. Uh, sorry, you won't know how to fulfill your salah. You won't know how to fulfill or give out zakah. So anyone who reads their five daily prayers and then says that I only follow the Quran, they are negating themselves within themselves by fulfilling the salah. Completely. I said, Allahu Akbar. I started by raising my hands. I faced the Qibla. Okay, face the Qibla, one might argue that, okay, it's in the Quran. No problem. What about how you said Allahu Akbar, what you said thereafter, what you said, you read Surah Al-Fatiha. How do you know to read Surah Al-Fatiha? How do you know to bow down, when to bow, when to go to pray, when to say Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, what to say? All of that is from the Hadith. If you discount the Hadith, you discount the deen. So the Prophet ﷺ predicted this and he says there will be a man sitting on his recliner saying, I only accept what is in the Quran. Do you know what the idea is? To make Muslims by name only. So the Hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says towards the end of time, لا يبقى من الإسلام إلا اسمه ولا من القرآن إلا رسمه. There will come a time when nothing will remain from Islam besides its name. Islam, what are you? I'm a Muslim. But what's a Muslim all about? I don't know. I just know I'm a Muslim. And what will remain from the Quran? Just its patterns. It's writing. That's all. So what is this? It's the Quran. Can you read it? No, I can't. Do you understand it? No, I can't. So it's all to do with the signs of the hour. At the end of time, knowledge will go away. How does knowledge go away? Step by step. You have these wise cracks who come and tell you, I will only accept the Quran. But in his life, he's proven that he's already adopting the sunnah. But with his mouth, he's saying, I don't. But he's reading salah five times a day. To say five times a day already is from the sunnah. So this is why it's important for you to know these responses. Today, you and I know that social media is ruling in a lot of ways. Do you know that? It's ruling. And people are using it in order to snatch your faith away from you by trying to make it seem like Islam is barbaric, Islam is like this, Islam is like that. I tell you what, Muslims are too good. We haven't picked on Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism. We haven't picked on it the way they pick on us. There are verses in, in the Bible that are far more terroristic than anything that you could have in the Quran. I have seen a study of the words of hate, the words of killing, the words of terrorism, the words of suicide, the words of so many evil words that we found in other scriptures. But that's not our job. Why? Islam, we are taught, draw a straight line, carry on, bother about yourself. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu alaykum anfusakum la yadurrukum man dalla ila ahtadaytum O you who believe, be concerned about yourselves. Those who are astray will not harm you if you are guided yourselves. The problem is a lot of us don't have knowledge. So that's why we don't know how to respond. This is why, what did I start with? I said, learn the Quran. I made everyone feel guilty, right? At the beginning. And the people were just looking at me. I mean, I saw all the brothers and sisters doing this. Oh, lazy? Me lazy? If I was lazy, I wouldn't have been here. What time did you come? I think very few came at 9 o'clock in the morning, right? Lazy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. 
So my brothers and sisters, the point being raised is when you know and you have knowledge and you are convinced, yes, teach others, convey the message, clarify the misconceptions, but remember, they will always say one or two things more than you can. They will pick on your faith. They say Islam is a dirty faith. Well, we feel very clean, subhanAllah. And Islam hates this and hates that. To be honest with you, it is an upright faith. We preach and promote peace and harmony and goodness. It's just that, subhanAllah, you know, recently a man wanted to accept Islam and he accepted Islam. But he told me, I have one problem. What is the problem? There are too many rules and regulations in Islam. That's the only thing that's making me delay, you know. So I told him, I said, my beloved brother, listen to this. The more rules and regulations you have, the happier and more content you will be because you've disciplined yourself. And I told him, you know people in the clubs, right? Those who earn through the week and they spend whatever they've earned in the week in the weekend, right? Those who earn through the month and they spend at the end, their life is all about partying. Do you know that? It's all about what? Partying. Right? Every Friday evening, that's it, we're done, drunk, gone, clubbing. If not drinking, then nowadays intoxicants. Don't lie to yourself about it. It's the in thing. People feel there's nothing wrong with weed. I'm sure you know that. Muslims now are, are catching on that and saying, but Sheikh, weed, come on, nothing wrong, weed, come on, weed. And you and I know that the only weed allowed for us is touch weed, right? <laughs> so the reality is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to do something, remember there will be contentment in fulfilling it and there will be loss of contentment in going against it. So those who are partying, look at their lives. They are depressed in most cases or they don't have wealth. They are paying when Allah says, speaks about interest and so on. Yeah, look at those who are stuck in interest. They can't come out. They are depressed. Suddenly they lost their jobs. They didn't plan to lose a job. They were retrenched. They became suicidal. The highest amount of suicide at a certain stage was the credit crunch in the States where people started killing themselves because they came, the house was taken, the, the the television was taken, the, the car was taken, everything else was taken. They found themselves on the street with no job and they still had a massive debt on their shoulders that they had to pay. So if you had followed Islam from the beginning and lived within your means, that wouldn't have happened. Similarly, you know, and I'm going to say this because we need to talk about it. It's, it's something that's happening on the globe. You see the industry that is making the most money, according to some of the findings, Cosmetics, right? Cosmetics, what happens? That fashion industry, so much money. Why? It's making you be a person who's never happy with what you look like, never. I'm never happy, no matter what. Try this, try that, and you spend so much money on it. And Islam says, you know what? Just dress in a way that you don't have to show the rest of the people. Put on a cloak and walk out. You don't have to show them your legs. You don't have to show them anything else. You don't have to show them even your size. People don't need to comment about this and that. You need to be a healthy person. Sometimes people who are big are healthier than those who are small. You know? <laughs> That's brother Wahid, mashallah. He doesn't mind. <laughs> they are healthier than those who are smaller. It's, it's got to do with whether you're healthy. Sometimes those who are thin, like sticks, they are unhealthy. So it's got to do with being healthy. So speaking about cosmetics, so you become a person who's never happy. You're not content because why? You have to paint yourself before you even answer the door. You have to paint yourself. You can't even look in the mirror in the morning. I know, wallahi, I know of cases where the wife has never shown her husband what she looks like without makeup. I promise you, this is not a joke, it's a true story. And there's not just one, there's a few. So when we become enslaved by these things, we become sad, we become depressed. We're leading a life that is fake. So Islam tells us to value you through your character, your conduct, your dedication to the deen, your spirituality, and so many other things. Now, if we were to follow these rules and regulations, what would happen? I would be a person who's saving up my money. I wouldn't be wasting. I would be at home most of the time. I would get happiness out of 
you know, serving each other in the home, helping my parents, looking at my spouse and going out with my family, spending time with my family and so on. I don't drink, so I've saved a lot. I don't party, so I've saved a lot. I don't smoke, so I've saved a lot. You may want to perhaps touch up with a little bit of makeup here and there, but I'm not enslaved by it, for example. So I've saved a lot of money. And what happened? I don't have to sweat morning to evening, every morning, every evening, and then waste that money in the weekend. I have time for my maker, and I know that I'm going to the hereafter, whereby there will be a currency required to build or to have a palace there, and that is known as deeds. If I want a palace in the hereafter, how am I going to pay for it? Not with dollars, not with pounds. I need to pay with deeds. But if I've spent my whole day and night earning dollars and pounds, what happened to my deeds? Where did they go? So you need to balance yourself. You need to understand this balance. And you need to know that as much as I will earn a living in this world, the Almighty says if you earn it in the right way, that itself will be a good deed. Let's get back to what we were saying about following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So some people say, we won't follow him. We will sit back and we will just adopt the Quran. And the excuse is, there's something weak, something fabricated. Well, why don't you go into the studies? There are people who've done it for you, telling you this is a fabricated narration. Done. This is a weak narration. This is a strong narration. This is the interpretation of this narration. There are some narrations where we need to know the story behind the speech. That's what it is. You know, yesterday someone sent me a message saying, if you have backbitten someone and wronged them and usurped them and sworn them and everything, then this is the dua to read and Allah will forgive you. <laughs> this is the dua. And they quoted the narration from Sahih al-Bukhari. In Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ made mention of a hadith, Oh Allah, if I have done this for this person, that person, then let it be a means or let it be an act of worship for them or write it for them as, as a, an act of worship. What that narration means and what they've interpreted to mean are two different things. Why? They don't have the knowledge. It is not a green light to say backbite people, swear them, and at night just say that dua ten times and everything is over. That's not correct. Not at all. If you look at that narration, it's the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, on a specific incident. Something happened and he made the dua for the person. That's the Prophet. For you and I, if you say, Oh Allah, if I've sworn someone, let that be an act of worship for him. Like say, for example, a sacrificial animal or whatever. What acts of worship do you have to be able to donate to someone else when you and I desperately need it for ourselves? What guarantee do you have? It's like you saying, Okay, Oh Allah, whoever I owe money to here, take money from my money and give them the money. What money do you have in the first place so that you're going to give them? So, this is a misinterpretation, as I say. Yes, there is a lesson to be learned from that. But, the misinterpretation is we're just encouraging people to say, you know, in Islam you have to go to the person and you have to say, I'm sorry, I wronged you, I swore you, I did this, I back bit about you, please forgive me. They have the right to say yes or no. And I encourage you to say yes. If you forgive, Allah will forgive you. Not to say if you don't forgive, Allah won't forgive you, but then you're going to leave the record for the hereafter. And the record for the hereafter, you, you don't know which way it's going to go. You really don't know which way it's going to go. I'd rather forgive and say, oh Allah, I found it hard to forgive, but I forgave because in the hereafter, I don't want to be caught. I want to be forgiven as well. So, interestingly, if we were to just take a little bit of time, to look at the narrations, we would come to see what is weak, what is fabricated, what is disputed, and what is authentic. Even if someone says, I only want to follow that which is absolutely authentic from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he or she will have to make a little bit of an effort. To do what? To study. Study the narrations, find out why, keep on asking, ask why, ask how, what's the explanation, how can I understand this and so on. That's when you will know. 
The problem with us, we've got no time. We're busy earning morning to evening, I'm working. Well, you need to do something before it's too late. So I was telling about that brother when I explained to him that the more rules and regulations you follow, the more content you will be. And I gave him an example, so many examples. One of them was of a school. I said, if you have a school that has no rules and regulations, anyone goes there, no uniform, no proper timing, everybody comes out, the result will be that a lot of them will fail their examinations. They just go to school, have a party, come back. Exam time, they won't know what to say. But if you have a school where there's so many rules, your timing, your uniform, what you do, handing in your work, your homework, the textbooks, everything else needs to be in order. And so much of discipline, they penalize you when you do something wrong in their own way. What will happen? You, you will achieve. The results will be much better than a school that has no rules or very little or rules that are there, but no one follows them. Some of the religions we have on the globe today, they have very similar rules to Islam. But over time, people just change them. And they said, ah, it doesn't suit me. So what should we do? Just delete it. From the top, they deleted it. Khalas. This thing here, excuse it. Let's interpret it differently. You know, when I look at the term wine, wine, wine. Today we know wine as an intoxicating drink, okay? But wines, even in the Arabic language, if you take a look at the terms that were used some time back used to refer to fruit juices that are pure. A fruit juice that is pure. So when you say, for example, this is just an example, that Jesus drank a wine. What are you talking about? You're talking of fruit juices that are pure. And after some time, if that language happened to change, the reality didn't change. The language changed. And then when people made it, no, there's nothing wrong with it. We're supposed to drink this. Wow. We're supposed to drink this. So it becomes like compulsory to drink it. Astaghfirullah. This is why in Islam, knowledge comes down. We have a chain of narrators. Even when it comes to the hadith, it's the only knowledge ever that you will have that has a strict chain of narrators. Where did you get this from? From this book where did this book get it from from here where did that man get it from from there where did that man get it from from there you can trace it all the way back to muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that is called knowledge if you cannot trace it there's a problem with it so today subhanallah one of the reasons why people get upset or one of the reasons why people want to distance themselves from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is also because there are fabricated narrations that we don't know, nobody, sometimes meaning we as the laymen, we don't know and we are too embarrassed because, oh, is that a statement of the Prophet? No way, I'm rejecting it. Hang on, wait, don't word it that way. Is that really a statement of the Prophet? That should be the question. Not just to say, anyone can say, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, and he will say whatever he wants. It sounds like a hadith, isn't it? When I was young, I used to go with my dad to the masjid, and he used to read a book called Riyadus Salihin in the masjid. And I used to hear him so often, little kid, small, I can't recall, four, five years old. All I remember is, An Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qala qala Rasulullah And I, I memorized that, and I didn't know what it meant. And as a kid, I used to run around saying, Qala, 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 I used to go around. I didn't even know what it meant. Why? Because that's supposed to be a narration, right? It's the, the starting, Abu Huraira narrated this, radiallahu anhu. With us, the minute someone says, Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet says, everyone tends to say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Hang on. If it sounds dodgy to you, don't just discount the hadith. Ask yourself, is this really a statement? If you find out that it really is, then ask yourself, what is the proper explanation? There you are. And 100% of the time, 10 out of 10 of the time, you will understand the beauty in it. After you've sought the answers to the questions that may have come to your mind. You might not get the answer from one person. You know, people ask questions about certain things. You ask one man, you're not really so convinced. You ask another one, ask a third one. Those who have knowledge. 
There will come a time when someone will be able to beautifully explain it to you to say, you know what? This is what it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So, this evening I was tasked to speak about the importance of the sunnah. And I've only but started. There are so many verses of the Quran where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited these verses and at the same time, he was the one who was being whom we were being instructed to follow. Let me give you an example. At the time of dispute, a lot of people say, okay, I want to do it the proper Islamic way. And then you hear what the Islamic way is, and suddenly you say, hang on, hang on, I want to do it another way. Why? Because it doesn't suit you. That's why. It doesn't suit you. We have divorce cases, inheritance cases, so many other cases. You say, I want to do it the proper way. Inheritance case. I want to do it proper way because according to you, if you go according to any other way, you might lose. And then when you are told that, hang on, it's not actually the way you thought it was. No, 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 no. I don't want it this way. So Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Nay, they are not considered true believers until they make you the judge in their disputes between them. Then, ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Once the judgment is passed, the true believers do not feel any negative feeling about that judgment in their hearts. They surrender, a proper surrender. So you go and you ask the Messenger وسلم, to judge in the dispute and he passes a judgment you should feel happy about it even if it was passed against you. That's a true believer. Why? Because the messenger's instruction is final. There you are. We should also feel the same. Sometimes people are after money. Remember, we are taught as Muslims and human beings would also know if they were bothered to look into it that contentment does not come with figures. It comes with the blessings in those figures. I could have a small amount and I could be a happy person and I could have a large amount and perhaps I can't sleep at night. Contentment has nothing to do with the figure you have. It's got to do with the blessings in whatever figure you have. Why? When you surrender, that's when Allah will give you that happiness. So that is another verse. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yet in another place in the Quran, more than one place, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If you are disputing regarding anything, then go back to Allah and His Messenger. Go back to Allah and His Messenger. It was enough for him to just say, go back to Allah. But he says, go back to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are some of the verses that I have chosen to actually make mention of in order to explain what I have been tasked to explain this evening. I hope my brothers and sisters that you can take from what we've said and I hope I've expressed to you and explained to you the importance of the sunnah in the life of a Muslim. Sunnah here referring to whatever came from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his qualities, his mannerisms, his style, his way, his speech, his confirmations and his entire history and biography. So that's an all-encompassing history of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in any way. Obviously, there are different levels to that. So someone might say hadith. Hadith is referring to a specific group of from among what I just said. And then someone might say the seerah. The seerah is referring to more historically, but it would include a lot as well. Someone might say the term sunnah in reference to that which is not a bid'ah, bid'ah meaning innovation. Remember at the beginning I said every messenger came to teach us how to worship Allah. So I want to end off by speaking about it for a moment. If there is any act of worship that was not done by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your best bet is to leave it. Your best bet is to leave it. I tell you why. 
When we meet Allah on the day of Qiyamah, He will ask us about everything, right? So, you worship, yes. You read your five salah, yes. You read this, you did this, yes. You did. For example, right? So you are asked about absolutely everything. Then, why did you do this? If you did something that was an innovation, something that the Prophet ﷺ did not do in terms of acts of worship, you won't have an answer. Oh, you know, I heard people doing it, but you know, but yeah, so I just did it. But wait, there was no instruction of ours. Rather you be a person who says, I didn't do it. When Allah says, why didn't you do it? I didn't do it because there was a dispute about it so bad and I didn't find a proper narration saying that it was done by the messenger or taught by him or done by his companions. So I left it out. Trust me, you stand a better chance to go to paradise. Because the hadith says, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa raddun. Whoever does a deed that our instruction is not upon, the evil of the deed will go back to them. You want an evil of a deed? I wasted my time doing the deed. And on top of that, I got a sin for it. That's a waste. You put all your money and you know it's, getting, it's going to get stolen. It's like investing with a thief. That's what it is. You put all your money with a thief and you say, don't worry, I know I put my money. Every day someone says, so where's your money? I, I invested it. Where? With that guy. And they all tell you, you wasted your time. We are investing our time, effort, energy with a bid'ah, with an innovation. It's not worthy. So this is why we say, if you really follow Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do you know what will happen? You will become a person who's so possessive that when there is something that he didn't come with, you will love him enough to say, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to risk my link with him. On the day of